Hello, thanks for joining me. Today I want us to have a look at the first 18 or so verses of uh, Paul's letter to the Colossians. Paul wrote the letter to remind the Colossian believers that they have everything they need in Christ and to encourage them, therefore, to live in the good of it. And as we go through this section, um, we're going to be reminded of the great blessings that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ and also of his preeminence, which should encourage us to want to serve him all the more faithfully. So as we as we read the section and then have a look at the verses, let's let's see what we can learn um, together. So first of all, we'll read the first 18 verses of Colossians chapter one. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Timothy our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are in Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of your love for all the saints, because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, of which you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which has come to you, as it has also in all the world, and is bringing forth fruit, as it is also among you, since the day you heard and knew the grace of God in truth. As you also learned from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, who also declared to us your love in the Spirit. For this reason we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you, and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will, in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might, according to his glorious power, for all patience and long suffering with joy giving thanks to the Father, who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has delivered us from the power of darkness, and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of his love, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. And he's before all things, and in him all things consist. And he's the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. And we trust that God will add his blessing to that reading from his word and subsequent readings as we go on. So what, what can we learn from this uh, first chapter um, of Paul's letter to the Colossians? Well Paul begins the letter by introducing himself as an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, which reminds us that the things that Paul writes in this letter are written on God's authority. Paul hadn't decided to take on himself the role of an apostle, but rather God, in his purpose, had chosen Paul to carry out the great work of being able to testify firsthand to the reality of the risen Lord Jesus, and to be one of the main teachers through whom God would communicate to the early church. Therefore, something that's important for us to remember when we're reading what Paul has written is that we're reading what God has instructed him to write. Sometimes you might get people who will say things like, well, Paul was only writing for his day, or some of the things that Paul says, well, they're, they're, they're kind of cultural and don't really apply to us today. But if you start to pick and choose which parts of scripture you like, then you end up with exactly the situation that Paul was writing to the Colossians to guard against, which was an alternative message to what is revealed in Scripture. In his second letter to Timothy, 
Paul wrote that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. And Paul also includes Timothy here um, in his introduction. Paul describes uh, Timothy to the believers at Corinth um, as his beloved and faithful son in the Lord. And he told the Philippians that Timothy was the only one that he could send who would care for them because he had proven his character. Timothy had stuck by Paul during difficult times and he clearly had genuine care and love for other believers. And although we aren't told too much about him, from what we are told, he's a really good example for us to follow. And here Paul simply describes him as Timothy, our brother, which carries with it the idea of the equality of all believers in the eyes of God. There's no sense of hierarchy here, with Paul being the superior and Timothy the inferior or anything like that, but rather they were partners in the service of the Lord. And it was always Paul's longing that all believers would experience the fullness of God in their lives. And in verse 2 we see that his desire is that they are in the good of God's grace and peace. And these are two of the greatest blessings of being in Christ. First of all, God's grace. We need God's grace every day of our lives. We still have our old sin nature within us. And even though we experience God's amazing grace at salvation, we need to keep depending on it to sustain us through our daily lives. We can't rely on our own strength for salvation. And we can't rely on our own strength to live for God either. We need always to be dependent on God. Because if we attempt to do things on our own, we usually end up sooner or later getting into difficulty when the old nature starts reasserting itself. The second blessing is God's peace. That peace that passes all understanding. How thankful we should be that as a result of our faith in Christ, we have peace with God. The peace that exists within the soul of a believer is the greatest peace that can ever be known. And again, this is mo more than what happens at salvation. Because Paul writes this to the Philippians. He writes, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So in a world where turmoil and strife are escalating all around us, it's good to remind ourselves that we have a God to whom we'll turn, or to whom we can turn, and he'll hear us. And we know that we can leave those things that distress us, that upset us, in his hands. And we can experience the peace that only he can give. One other point to note in this verse is that um, the phrase grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ immediately emphasises for us the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ as Father and Son are presented as equal. And that sets the tone for Paul's argument um, that the Lord Jesus is the preeminent one that we'll, that we'll be going on to consider. Now going into verse 3. Um, in verse 3, Paul um, he goes on to encourage uh, the believers by telling them, that he gives thanks to God and prays always for them. And what makes this especially remarkable is that these were people that Paul had never actually met. We learn from chapter 2 and verse 1 um, that Paul writes 
um, for I want you to know what a great conflict I have for you and those in Laodicea and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh. Yet they're always in his prayers. And here we see the great love that Paul shows towards other Christians. And his, his desire is that they would grow in Christ. And that's a great challenge for each one of us, I think. How often do we pray for those Christians that we know personally? Never mind those that we don't. We know from elsewhere in scripture that Paul um, prayed for many people by name. And this is a great practice, a great example that we should seek to emulate. It's so easy to become distracted when we pray um, or to become so focused on ourselves when we pray. We of course need to pray for ourselves, but a big part of our prayer lives should be for other believers. Therefore, we need to take an interest in one another, in one another so that we can pray for each other intelligently. And Paul also commends them um, in verse 4 for their love for all the saints. He rejoices, first of all, in their faith. And this is the evidence that their faith is genuine. It's faith in the Lord Jesus that saves, but the reality of that faith is demonstrated in works. And you can read more about that um, in more detail in James chapter 2. The lesson for us here is that we should have love for all our fellow believers. We've already thought that there is no partiality with God and there should be no partiality with us either in how we treat other Christians. Naturally there will be some people that we get on better with than others but that shouldn't stop us showing love to all believers when we get the opportunity. Each believer is of value to God and it should be our practice to value one another as well. And it's a question that we all need to think about. How do we, how do I demonstrate love for all the saints? Now moving into verse 5. Paul gives thanks for the hope that the believers have within them. Notice it's not a hope, but the hope. It's something that's real and there's no sense of it not being fulfilled. The hope of the believer is certain because it's granted to us by God. And Paul reminds them that it's laid up for them in heaven. Which means that it can never be taken away. And this really should focus our minds, I think, on spiritual things as being the most important and what we should cling to through every situation that we face in this world. We have a hope laid up in heaven that one day we'll be with Christ and experience all the blessings of an eternity with him. And at this point, at this point, Paul reminds the Colossians that this is what they'd heard before. This is what is the truth. What they heard before, the message that they'd heard which resulted in their salvation, is the word of the truth of the gospel. Paul is here, Paul here is trying to show them that what they've always had in the Lord Jesus Christ is sufficient and it can't be added to by any new thing that's been dreamed up by man. The Lord Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth and the life. The Lord Jesus Christ is the truth. He is the gospel. If you don't have Christ, then you don't have the truth. But if you have Christ, then you have everything. And this is something that we constantly have to keep reminding ourselves, particularly when we're going through periods of difficulty. And Paul tells the Colossians that the truth has come to them um, in verse 6, as it has also in all the world. Now the gospel was spreading fast and it was Paul's desire that it be communicated in every part of the known world. 
And that work's still going on today. And each one of us is involved in it. Wherever we are, we can continue the work that was begun by Paul um, and others of taking the gospel to our fellow men and women so that it continues to be proclaimed in all the world. The gospel was bringing forth fruit, so people were getting saved um, wherever the gospel was being preached, including at Colossae. And Paul says, since the day that they heard and knew the grace of God in truth, the gospel had been bringing forth fruit. So in addition to more people getting saved, there was also progression in the lives of those who were saved first. And the lesson here is that the gospel should always be bringing forth fruit in our lives as we grow closer to and more like the Lord Jesus, if we're living as we ought. It's not a case of getting saved and then that's it. Getting saved, then baptised and coming into fellowship in a local church is just the beginning. And it's how we then progress that brings forth the fruit of the gospel in our lives. And the phrase knew the grace of God in truth just at the end of verse 6 there is one that I want to highlight for an encouragement. What a privilege it is to know the grace of God. Not simply to know about it, but to know, to have experienced the reality of the grace of God in your life is something that is far beyond any, anything this world could ever offer. And as we've already thought, because we've experienced God's grace, we have God's peace in our hearts and a multitude of other blessings that will endure for eternity. Moving into verse 7, Paul now mentions Epaphras and that the believers had learned the things that he's been speaking about from Epaphras, from him. Um, again, to encourage them that in Christ they have all that they'll ever need and that what they believed when they first heard the gospel is the, is the truth of God. And Paul clearly has a great deal of affection for Epaphras. And if we could be described in the same way as this relatively unknown believer, I think they'd be doing quite well. Paul um, calls him a dear fellow servant and a faithful minister of Christ. If we examine our lives, how would we be described by others? Epaphras is someone who appears to the same desires as Paul for winning others for Christ and seeing them continue in the faith. And he was obviously someone who laboured diligently for the Lord. And he was recognised and, and commended for this. In chapter 4 and verse 12 um, of the letter, Paul tells the Colossians that Epaphras, who was, fr who was from Colossae, was continually praying for them, that they might stand perfect and complete in the will of God. Paul tells them that Epaphras has a great zeal for them, and not only for them, but also the believers in Laodicea and Hierapolis. And what an encouragement for the Colossians to know that both Paul and Epaphras were continually upholding them in prayer. And it's encouraging to know that others are praying for you. And maybe we don't tell others we're often that we're praying for them. Maybe we should. Scripture doesn't really tell us anything more about Epaphras, but what it does tell us, we can use as an example for how we should try to live. And Epaphras had shared his delight with Paul in seeing people coming to know the Saviour and then going on. Um, and we should rejoice at the salvation of others too. And Epaphras had obviously told Paul about their salvation and also their growth. And he had positive things to say about the believers. And that's a good example for us too. 
Sometimes we can all too easily be critical of one another and it's good for us to rejoice with others in their blessings. And this letter is all about the great things that we have in the Lord Jesus. And so often we can let minor things rob us of that joy. So let's instead use Epaphras as our example. And Paul gives their spiritual growth as another reason for them being constantly in his prayers. This is now we're moving it into verse 9. Um, and he goes to set out a list of four things that he prays for them. Firstly, it was his desire that they would experience the fullness of Christ in their lives. Paul wanted them to be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. He wanted their lives to be fully in line with God's purposes and to be what God wanted them to be. The only way to serve God effectively is to find out what God is like. And the only way we can do that is through reading the scriptures, getting to know them and constantly re-examining them as we always find something that we haven't noticed before. And God has revealed so much of his character to us through the Bible and also in the person of the Lord Jesus. And it's our responsibility to study the scriptures and allow them to mould us so that we can then be what God wants us to be and walk in the paths that he would have us walk. And Paul desires that not only are they filled with the knowledge of God's will, but that they are so in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. In James 3 and 17 we read, The wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Spiritual understanding and wisdom as evidenced here are the practical demonstrations of the knowledge of God. And this is how God wants us to live for him in this world. Secondly, Paul prays for them that they may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him. That's the beginning of verse 10, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him. That we can do anything at all to please the Lord is amazing. But because we're in Christ, we are able to please him. As everything that Christ did pleased the Father. God the Father said of the Lord Jesus at his baptism, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. The Lord Jesus did at all times those things that brought pleasure to his Father. And because we're identified with him, when we do good works, we are able to please the Father. Before we were saved, all our righteousnesses were as filthy rags in the sight of God, because our sin was the great barrier between us and God. But when we trusted in Christ, that barrier was removed. Therefore, when God looks on us, he sees Christ. So that even our little efforts, slight, though they are, are able to bring pleasure to the heart of God. And that should be our encouragement to keep on going on the Christian pathway. Thirdly, Paul prays that they should be fruitful in every good work. This practical expression of our spiritual understanding should pervade all areas of our lives. We don't just live for God occasionally, but it should be our way of life. And in addition to good works, Paul speaks of them increasing in the knowledge of God. As we've already thought, it's imperative that as believers, we strive to learn more about God through the scriptures so that we may become more like the Lord Jesus. And that should be the goal 
of every believer. Fourthly, Paul desires that they might be strengthened with all might according to his glorious power. We have to pray for strength to live for God and in his goodness he'll give it to us. If we are not walking closely with God or if we're trying to do things on our own strength then we won't get the strength from God that we need to fight our spiritual battles because we're not relying on him. We constantly need to look to God to sustain us through our lives and according to his glorious power. What we need to remember is that the greatest power in the universe is at work in our lives. And that, that's something that's absolutely mind-blowing. The greatest power in the universe is at work in our lives. Yet, despite this, how often do we try to get, back, get by on our own feeble strength? We need to constantly remind ourselves to rely on him. And what are we strengthened for? Verse 11. We are strengthened for all patience and long-suffering. We're given strength for the trials and the spiritual battles that we'll face while living here as believers in the Lord Jesus. And God will put us through testing times, but that's so that our reliance on him might grow and our acceptance that he, that he is in control of all our circumstances may become established. Patience and long-suffering are words of humility. And from a worldly perspective, they're not words that we would use when describing a battle. Um, and perhaps they're not characteristics that we would think would win a battle. Humility in the world is seen as weakness. But our battles aren't won by putting ourse ourselves forward and being brash and arrogant. But rather, our battles are won by surrendering ourselves to God and allowing him to shape and mould our lives. And there are a number of examples of this um, in the scriptures. For example, in 2 Corinthians 12, Paul says this, speaking of the Lord, And he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And in Isaiah chapter 30 and verse 15, in a passage where God is telling the children of Israel that they're doing wrong, he says, in quietness and in confidence shall be your strength. They were doing the opposite, and because of that, they were getting further away from God. But we can have complete confidence in God that we, that he will never leave us nor forsake us. And so we need to rest in him to see us through the tough times. And we're not strengthened merely to endure long suffering, but we're strengthened to face at the end of verse 11 with joy. Joy is not something that we naturally associate with long suffering. But if we think of the blessings that we have in the Lord Jesus, both present and future, and the fact that we're often brought through difficult circumstances to make us learn more about God and make us more like the Lord Jesus, that should fill us with joy. Think of the disciples. Um, after they had appeared before the Jerusalem Council and had been beaten and commanded to no longer preach the gospel. We're told in Acts 5 and 41 that they departed from the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer for his name. 
and in prison, having been beaten half to death. The reaction of Paul and Silas was to sing hymns of praise to God. Now, I don't know about you, but I, f I find that very challenging in how I respond to situations that I wouldn't choose to be in. In James chapter 1, we read, My brother, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Now that's not to say that no matter what, we will always be happy. Happiness and joy are not really the same thing. Happiness very much depends on our immediate circumstances. But the joy that we have in Christ is a much deeper satisfaction or contentment that he is our saviour. He's in control of all things and nothing, no matter how big it may seem, can pluck us out of his hand. And finally, moving into verse 12, the final part of Paul's prayer for the Colossians is that he gives thanks to God for the blessings that salvation has brought us into. Uh, Paul says that he has qualified us, God has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. The Father has qualified us. It's nothing to do with ourselves and what we can bring. It's not about us proving ourselves to be found worthy, but as we've thought, it's all of the grace of God. And we're in the light. Our eyes have been opened by the light of the gospel. And we now have a part of the great inheritance of which all believers have a part. And in, and in qualifying us for this inheritance, moving into verse 13, what has God done for us? Well, he's delivered us from the power of darkness. We should never underestimate what our salvation means. We've been set free from the power of darkness. A power that has this world tightly in its grip. And an individual can only be released supernaturally by the power of God in his life. And we've been set free from this into the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. We've been brought from darkness into light, from death to life. We have redemption through his blood. Verse 14, we have redemption through his blood. Let's never forget that we've been bought with a price, the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Later uh, in this chapter, in, in, in verse 20, Paul says the Lord Jesus has made peace through the blood of his cross. And it's very striking to think that our peace was brought about through the violence of Calvary. The blood of the Lord Jesus is of utmost importance, for without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. All the Old Testament sacrifices merely provided a, a temporary ceremonial cleanness for the people so that they could, could worship God as he had instructed. It was only the shedding of the blood of the Lord Jesus that allowed sins to be forgiven completely. In Hebrews 10 we read this, And every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. From that time, waiting till his enemies are made his footstool, for by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. Paul continues to impress upon the Colossians the fact that because they have Christ, they have everything. With a lovely celebration of the Lord Jesus Christ uh, from verses 15 to 18. Um, it's a lovely celebration of both his person and his work. He's the image of the invisible God. Everything that God is was demonstrated in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. In chapter 2 of this letter, 
Paul says that in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. When he was on earth, one of the things that outraged the Jews so much was when the Lord Jesus said, I and my Father are one. Because in saying that, he was claiming equality with God. The Lord Jesus never did anything that was contrary to the mind and character of God. He wasn't a copy, he wasn't an imitation, but the image of the invisible God. And verses like this make it so clear that the Lord Jesus is God. Now many would dispute that and they would try to tell us otherwise. And it's a feature of the false cults that many, if not all of them, reject the truth of the deity of the Lord Jesus. In conversation, they might try to make you believe that you've actually got quite a lot in common with them. But if they deny the deity of the Lord Jesus, you've got nothing in common with them. The Bible conclusively presents the Lord Jesus as being God. In his book, Mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis wrote this. We must think of the Son always, so to speak, streaming forth from the Father like light from a lamp or heat from a fire, or thoughts from a, ma from a mind. He's the self-expression of the Father, what the Father has to say. And there never was a time when he was not saying it. Paul then goes on to say, to write in um, verse 15, the second part of verse 15, that he's the firstborn over all creation. And that's not referring to the Lord Jesus as a created being, but rather referring to his rank as the one who has authority over creation. There are people who would try to tell us that what this verse means is that the Lord Jesus was the very first being to be created. But that's nonsense. And that's refuted actually in the very next verse when Paul tells us that by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are on earth. If all things were created by him, he cannot both be the creator and a creature. Therefore, he is God with complete authority over his creation. And Paul tells us that all things were created through him and for him. Through him speaks to us of his power and for him speaks to us of his purpose. We were created for a purpose. And that purpose is to bring pleasure to God through faith in his Son. We live in a world where, sadly, so many people are blinded by Satan into believing that life has no purpose. But we can rejoice that we know the meaning of the purpose of life and that it's found in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 17, he's before all things and in him all things consist. Again, this just emphasizes to us the, superior, the superiority of the Lord Jesus Christ in the universe. He's above and beyond all others and he's the one who keeps the universe going. And how amazing to think that he's our saviour. And that should fill our hearts with joy. And Paul was telling these things to the Colossians so that their hearts would be full with joy. Also, as they realised that they needed nothing outside of him. That because they had him, they had everything. And the Lord Jesus in verse 18 is also the head of the body the church and this reminds us that everything we do collectively and individually as believers needs needs to have Christ at the center because he's our head he is what matters and his praise adoration and exaltation should always be our desire and our goal and Paul also tells us in verse 18 that the Lord Jesus is the firstborn from among the dead.
And this is another proof that verse 15 isn't talking about the Lord Jesus as being the first to be created. This is exactly the same phrase. And the Lord Jesus was certainly not the first person to be raised from the dead, as he brought another a uh, number of others back to life. However, they all died again. What it means is that he's the most important person to have been raised from the dead. Because without his resurrection, no others could be raised. His resurrection was the sign that sin and death had been defeated. If the Lord Jesus hadn't risen from the dead, then he would be no saviour. Because death would have claimed him. And it would have been a pointless sacrifice. But we can rejoice today that our saviour is risen and exalted in heaven. He truly has preeminence in all things over both the physical and the spiritual and he's truly worthy of our praise. In the next section of the chapter, um, verses 19 to 23, which we don't have time to look at in detail, Paul reminds the Colossians of what they were and, and what we were, alienated and enemies, but now have been reconciled to God and been made blameless in his sight. And he encourages them to continue in the faith and to be grounded and steadfast. He encourages them not to lose sight of the hope that they have in the Lord Jesus and cling to the truth that's found only in him. And so let us be encouraged to, uh, to keep on going as we consider the greatness of the Lord Jesus and the certainty of what we have in him. Now, thank you very much for your attention.